good afternoon all those who are in the hall and those who are going out <laughs> uh, on behalf of uh, sir unit 1 department of surgical disciplines <laughs> but we have tamed this monster so this all about this case so uh, i welcome you all to our ccr title wrath of the mini monster it's all about the tiny glands the parathyroids usually as surgeons we are quite obsessed with removal of large tumors 10 kilos tumor 12 kilos tumor but today for a change uh, we'll share a case wherein this monster led to a condition called hypercalcemic crisis and uh, in this situation we can have symptoms related to central nervous system the cardiovascular system related to kidneys bones and abdomen so it has a widespread effect on the body and how we tame this monster by a well orchestrated multidisciplinary team approach we'll see that and we'll start this with a case and for that i'll call dr ayush junior resident surgery unit 1 um, good afternoon all uh, i'll be presenting the case our case was an So our case was an 11 year old school boy he was a student from delhi uh, he had complain of recurrent uh, episodes of severe pain abdomen in the past past 2 to 3 months next slide uh, he presented to the aim casualty with the complain of pain abdomen and anorexia uh, the pain was generalized and was severe in intensity it was uh, continuous and non colicky uh, the patient had a complain of constipation but was passing clitus there was no history of nausea vomiting and there is no other significant history uh, patient had uh, prior two episodes of hospitalization one 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 was uh, two months back in a private hospital where he was admitted uh, in view of enteric fever and was found to have hypercalcemia and second episode was a month ago where he had complain of severe pain abdomen and uh, fe uh, features consistent with subacute intestinal obstruction and septicemia with hypercalcemia uh, Uh, at the time of presentation patient had stable vitals and was afebrile uh, patient was conscious alert and well oriented to time place person on uh, the anthropometric parameters of the patient were within the normal limits as per his age uh, per abdomen examination uh, patient had a soft abdomen it was non tender non distended there was no organomegaly bubble sounds were present per rectum examination uh, rectum was not dilated and chest and cardiovascular examination were within limits in lab investigations all the parameters were within limits except for the serum calcium levels which were significantly raised it was 13.9 mg per dl which were consistent with hypercalcemia as the normal upper limit of uh, serum calcium levels in our lab is 10.2 on further workup for hypercalcemia the intact parathyroid hormone levels were found to be 206.7 pg per ml Uh, and with the normal vitamin d levels now these uh, findings biochemical parameters clinches the diagnosis for uh, primary hyperparathyroidism now to proceed further i would like to call dr yogita for the localization studies from department of nuclear medicine thank you good afternoon everyone so this patient was referred to us for 99 uh, m technetium ev scintigraphy which is a routine procedure performed for localization of hyper functioning parathyroid glands So uh, these are the 2D uh, planar imaging acquired 15 minutes and 2 hours after the injection of 99M technetium MB. So at 15 minutes we can see the normal physiological uptake in the salivary glands and normal tracer uptake in the thyroid gland, which shows normal washout at the late 2 hour imaging. However, there was no area of abnormal uptake seen in the neck and the mediastinal region. spec ct uh, these are the axial ct and few spec ct imaging so apart from the uh, uptake in the thyroid gland we can see an uh, faint area of abnormal tracer uptake superior to the 
upper pole of left lobe of thyroid which uh, and there is an ill defined soft tissue lesion in the ct as well which was better appreciated in the coronal imaging uh, with the dimension of 2 into 1.2 cm so a suspicious of left superior parathyroid adenoma was given now i would like to call dr priya from the radiology department Good afternoon. So next, uh, because of the inconclusive findings in the PET, they went ahead with the 4D CT, which is the multi-phasic CT scan for the localization of a parathyroid adenoma in cases of high suspicion of primary hyperparathyroidism. So we acquired a non-contrast CT followed by an arterial and a venous phase after iodinated contrast injection. So in the non-contrast images, we can see that there is a hypodense lesion posterior on the posterior aspect of the superior pole of left lobe of thyroid. which is showing a uh, mild enhancement in the arterial phase and also remains enhancing in the venous phase we can also see the attenuation differences in the non contrast it measures 66 so there is definite enhancement in the arterial phase and no significant washout in the venous phase it is hypodense compared to the rest of the thyroid that separates it from a thyroid nodule so these are the multiplanar images for the same lesion we can see the lesion on the posterior aspect of the superior lobe also seen in the sagittal and coronal reconstructions and uh, Uh, the measurement which we saw it was approximately 7 cross 7 and 1.6 cm in the cranio cordial or longitudinal dimension next i would like to call dr sukanya from pediatric endocrinology to discuss the initial management good afternoon so i'll be discussing the initial medical management of the child uh, when we had received this child he had a calcium of 14.9 mg per deciliter So we initially started him on this management, wherein he was to receive IV hyperhydration with 1.5 times his usual maintenance requirement and lactic injection. So the idea behind hyperhydration was to expand extracellular fluid volume, thereby promoting increased urinary losses. And lactic, as we all know, actually acts at the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle to bring about calcium losses. However, there was hardly any decline in serum calcium level following this, from 13.9 to 13.8 milligrams per deciliter. So we added another modality in the form of subcutaneous injections of calcitonin, which was supposed to be given every 12 hours. Because the oral intake of the child was quite good, even on IV hyperhydration, we decided to switch him to oral hyperhydration at the same time continuing him on injection Lasix. This actually resulted in a good response, wherein his calcium had declined from 13.8 to 11.6 milligrams per deciliter. But on the same night, he developed pain of abdomen and vomiting, which we assume would have uh, come in the way of his oral intake. And at the time when we evaluated him, he was noted to have very high levels of amylase and lipase. So this child had developed pancreatitis, and the serum calcium corroborating with this was 16 milligrams per deciliter. So we again made him move by mouth and re-initiated IV hyperhydration at 1.5 times his maintenance requirement. We also started him on pamidronate. He gave, uh, we gave him a single dose of pamidronate. Now this is a bisphosphonate which uh, brings about osteoclast-mediated inhibition of calcium resorption from the bone. We continued Lasix and calcitonin. Despite these measures, the calcium continued to rise up to 17.2 milligrams per deciliter, because of which we had to take further measures in the form of further increasing the hyperhydration to two times its maintenance requirement and increasing the frequency of calcitonin requirement to every eight hours. After this, as we can see, the calcium level actually started declining from 14 all the way to 9.4, which was the pre-operative value, and on this value, the child was taken up for surgery. Uh, he had become asymptomatic in that his pain, abdomen, and vomiting had settled, and amylase and lipase levels had declined to under 300 and under 1500 by the time he was ready for surgery. So now I'd like to invite Dr. Gopal to discuss the surgical management of this child. So, so uh, we uh, we had initially started him on IV fluids. But given that his oral intake was actually very good, we decided to discontinue the IV fluids and switch him to oral fluids, and that was probably where we might have gone wrong, and that would have precipitated this acute pancreatitis. Given that he was also receiving lactics, which have further contributed to volume contraction. So, so um. So 
Minister. So uh, when this child had come at the time, he had these values of 13.9, 11.6. He did have a system EB scan from outside, but that scan had actually not resulted in localization. We had also done a sonogram in house, which could not localize. So the earlier images which were discussed of the system EB scan and the 4D CT were actually done during the time that he had developed acute pancreatitis to localize the lesion. So, a final diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism with currently in hypercalcemic crisis causing acute pancreatitis and a culprit gland localized to left superior adenoma was made. So, in a usual case, when we have a biochemical diagnosis of PHPT, we go ahead with the ultrasound and a MEB scan of the neck simultaneously to localize the gland. Based upon that, if the gland is in the same site and the same side, that is as shown in the image, it becomes a concordant finding in which we do, in which, in which case, we do a focus parathyroidectomy. If the site is same but the site is different, it becomes a non-concordant finding. And if there is no agreement between the two, it becomes a discordant finding. And then we need a third uh, investigation to sort the issue, which is if either 4DCT or a fluorocholine patina setup. And after that, if we have a localized lesion, we again go for a focus parathyroidectomy. And if the lesion still remains unlocalized, we do a neck exploration. That is the usual treatment for protocol that we follow at our department. For this patient, we had a biochemical diagnosis of PHPT when we were contacted on about day 4. At that time, a USG which was done in the radiology department showed that it's a normal study and a MEB had a query localization of left superior parathyroid adenoma. So that was a fairly discordant finding and we needed somebody to resolve the issue. So we went ahead with a 4D CT scan and it localized the uh, disease to left superior adenoma and hence the decision to do a focused parathyroidectomy in an emergency setup was taken. So, I'll be briefly discussing about the steps of a focused parathyroidectomy. Initially, the patient is positioned in a thyroid position with a shoulder roll and a neck roll under the uh, neck so that we have a good extended neck. Then a skin incision is made and subplatysmal flaps are raised about 1 cm in all the directions. Then we have two options. Either we can open the strap muscle in the midline or at the lateral side between the sternocleidomastoid and the lateral border of the strap. That is the backdoor approach. And once we do that, we see that there is thyroid is visible along with the culprit parathyroid gland if the localization is correct in a case of focus parathyroid. For this patient, this is the interop image. I'm sorry for the clarity, but I'll try to, this is the head end of the patient. This is the foot end of the patient. This is the cut strap muscle. This is the uh, lateral edge of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the retracted thyroid gland with the back of the forceps. And this, we can see the popping out is the adenoma. So we are able to do it within an uh, incision of 3 to 4 cm because of the Department of Nuclear Medicine and Radiology pointing us to the right direction. So this is the intraoperative video of after localizing the gland, just taking the gland out and cutting its vascular supply. So this is the specimen which measures, which weighs 600 milligrams. So only a six thing which measures 600 milligram wreaked havoc on a patient and made him that sick. Now I'll call back Dr. Sukanya again to discuss the post-operative course as the, we handed over the patient to pediatric endocrinology after surgery. Um, so these are the post-op biochemical parameters of the child. We see the calcium is 9.7, the phosphate has come down to 1.9 and we see that the pH has been suppressed to 3.2. Uh, over the course of uh, his hospital stay subsequently, we realized that his calcium levels had uh, started declining from 9.7 to down to 7.7 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, we attributed the same to vitamin D deficiency that the child was noted to have. Uh, as we might have seen, his uh, pre of vitamin D values were absolutely normal. So because of this hypocalcemia and vitamin D deficiency, we started him on injectable calcium gluconate initially, and we also gave him a mega dose of uh, vitamin D. Subsequently, both calcium and phosphate began to rise until he had a normal value of calcium at 9 and a normal value of phosphate at 3.8 mg per at the time of discharge. He was discharged on over calcium carbonate and he's since then been following up and he's now been made of calcium carbonate and the child is doing well. So I'd like to give it over to Dr. Kupa.
So the question essentially comes that why we've chosen this case to be discussed here at this platform is that the concept of emergency parathyroidectomy initial reference date dates back to 1956 in the literature which reported 14 cases of parathyroid crisis at the time known as parathyroid crisis and majority of were diagnosed after the patient's death only two instances was an emergency parathyroidectomy performed and the patient was revived which made the mortality rate about 93% in that particular paper so they described that emergency parathyroid is done for parathyroid storm and is also known by other words to this day we know, know it as hypercalcemic crisis there is no uniform definition every article uses different definition however the most accepted arbitrary definition is that albumin corrected serum calcium of greater than 14 mg per deciliter and associated with the presence of organ dysfunction one or more the diagnosis should also be considered if there is calcium values less than 14 but the patient has a organ dysfunction the etiology most common being primary hyperparathyroidism followed by malignancy the epidemiology in a setup of phpt is about 1.6 to 6.7% of the patients presenting with phpt more frequently occurs in patients more than age 40 but can occur in pediatric setup we have two patients one of 7 years and one of 11 Majority of the series reported that female patients are more common since PHPT is seen in females predominantly. However, some studies have reported predominant male patients as well. The recurrent five to eight percent of the patients have recurrent PHPT. That in the primary setup they did not present with hypercalcemic crisis, but they presented with the recurrent PHPT with the hypercalcemic crisis. The mortality, which was initially ninety three percent, has now been reduced to fourteen percent and is well below that mark in the recent literature as well. the most common cl clinical presentation of these patients is bone pain followed by nephrolithiasis and fatigue the rarer more life threatening situations are renal failure acute pancreatitis altered sensorium and even de depression the other manifestations include weight loss renal insufficiency hematuria and other such so the essential management of these patient lies is a bi pronged approach that is calcium control and localization when both of them are done adequately then only we can proceed ahead proceed ahead with excision and during all this it's a race against time so the patients who are undergoing initial management can show variable response to that particular management and has been classified in various types by few of the authors this is one such uh, taken from one such paper is that the type 1 patients the calcium remains above the level of 14 and is not reduced and we have to perform a surgery in an immediate setup within 24 to 48 hours to re reduce the calcium then is the type 2 response in which the calcium will fall below the level of 14 which is the hypercalcemic cut off mark however it's above the normal value of the upper limit of calcium in these patients also we will have about a 48 to 72 hours window period of performing surgery so we can proceed ahead with a better localization then comes the third type of patients in which the localization the calcium for le level falls to almost the normal range in which again we have a better more time to localize the disease and proceed ahead with the focused parathyroidectomy if everything else fails we always have the plan of doing a bilateral neck exploration but with the means of localization it's better to go ahead with focused if possible so the second and the most the most definitive management is the surgery the crucial thing is the timing of surgery and we know that accelerated approach results in improvement within hours as depicted in our case however in the literature there is no consensus about the timing as there are limited number of studies done on this particular topic and majority of them have been retrospective because of the rarity of the condition however all this endocrine surgeons agree that the surgical intervention should be done within 48 to 72 hours and it has as mentioned by piyush sir also that it's a multidisciplinary coordinated team approach the outcomes of these patients are excellent 98% shows a response to the treatment they have high incidence of hypocalcemia requiring iv calcium which is fairly obvious because the calcium takes time to differ from the set point the higher set point comes down to a lower set point for which we need iv calcium the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is same as any other thyroid surgery less than 1% there is still a, a chance of 5 to 7% of recurrence of phpt in this patients because of a second adenoma or genetic disorder but the exact incidence of genetic syndromes in this patients have not been reported the median overall survival reported by one of the studies about 40 to 50 cases is they have followed the patient up to 15 years and median overall survival has been 11.7 years which is a fairly good in our experience of emergency parathyroid surgery we from 2016 to 2023 we have 36 total patients majority of them are female 
with a mean age of 38 years and the most common presentation by nephrolithic acid bone pain and fractures uh, the mean calcium in our patients was 15.2 with a range from 14 to as high as 20.3 PTH is 1300 picogram per ml and has went to as high as 4000. The mean time, mean time from presentation to surgery is 3.8 days and from localization to surgery is 2.1 days and this is improving as we are proceeding ahead in time because of a more focused and a coordinated team. The outcomes have been excellent. We have normalized serum calcium in 35 of the patients. 31 had a single adenoma with right inferior being the most common. And four patients had more than one adenoma. Unfortunately, we have had one mortality and in which the diagnosis of PHPT was also confusing because the patient had a malignancy induced hypercalcemia, which was diagnosed later, but the patient succumbed to the uh, hypercalcemia. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Professor Sunil Chumbar sir for uh, the take home message and the concluding remark. Thank you, Gopal. Actually, uh, uh, since uh, uh, I think uh, post 2000, we can say uh, we have got good localization uh, techniques and uh, we have full support from the radiology department, the department of nuclear medicine. And why these are important localization in this condition? Because we can go for uh, neck exploration in any of the patient, but the time taken will be more. And at times we can have ectopic glands, then we, we tend to miss them. So if the gland is localized, we can operate. And obviously, uh, if there is a bridging with pamidronate and hydration and less if kidneys are working, so we get the opportunity to pose the patient, to optimize the patient. And it has been shown that if we operate with very high calcium levels, chances of cardiac arrhythmias are very high. And uh, in children, we should uh, operate them and actually evaluate them, or rather I can say interpret the calcium reports very uh, wisely because the neonates and infants, they have very high calcium level compared to the adults and they catch the adult values by the age of 16 to 17 years. So we should uh, interpret uh, very carefully. And uh, here again, we have the full support of our anesthesia department. They never deny such a case. They, they will take the case any time in the day or not even during the night. So now I'll request uh, Professor Bal for his inputs. <laughs> Sir is having a uh, sore throat actually. Please, I just wanted to add one thing which I noted that this child had a hypocalcemia post-op. So it could be contributed by multiple reasons. Um, one is of course that there is a hungry bone syndrome if it's a, such a high PTH level was there beforehand. So obviously the bones have leached away all their calcium and immediately post-op they will take it up. So that is the most important reason. And then in this child pamidronate had also been given. So pamidronate was given, I think, about three days or two to three days prior to surgery. So that the peak effect of pamidronate also starts coming after around 48 to 72 hours. So that was also acting. And of course, vitamin D levels were, come, uh, were low, which I don't know why it happened. But pre-op, they were like 27 and then post-op, they were suddenly low. So that was one reason. So Otherwise, I think um, really kudos to the uh, endocrine surgery team because they uh, managed the patient very timely and uh, that led to a good outcome. Thank you. Parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism children is extremely rare and it has been classical teaching that you don't see hyperparathyroid or parathyroid adenoma in children. The way back in 93, first case from AMS was published by Dr. P.S.N. Menon and uh, myself, we published in Journal of Pediatric Endocrinology in 93. She was 13 year old girl. And uh, after that, we, after 2000, we are seeing a lot of uh, cases and uh, quite a number of du dual adenomas, which was earlier told if it is adenoma, it will be only one. Now we are seeing more dual adenomas. The third thing, uh, we have also several uh, emergency surgery, at least I remember four or five where uh, Dr. Chumbar has done on emergency basis. And uh, of course, uh, nowadays there is a fancy like you give some looking for the trees in the vexed uh, forest. Similarly, the 4D is another buzzword in uh, radiology. What is the fourth D? We are all 3Ds. Now this room is 3D, everybody is 3D. The time is the fourth D. So you can say dynamic. Anything changes with time, it is called dynamic. So you say dynamic city, instead of saying dynamic city, say the 4D city is very buzzword. Like tumor is always heterogeneous. 
So now there is texture analysis from CT image. You want to do texture analysis to see the tumor is heterogeneous. Elephant देखने के लिए कोई माइक्रोस्कोप नहीं लेके जाता. Anybody goes to see the elephant with a microscope? Nice micro. All the tumors are heterogeneous. What is new in it? Just tell me. Similar, there is a lot of buzzword in a computer using computer science and saying that this is fourth D. What is the fourth D? Is the time. Time is always as Einstein told long, long back, hundred years back that the fourth time, fourth dimension is your time, and anything that changes with time is dynamic. And because nuclear medicine people are dynamic chronogram, dynamic imaging, so they don't know. Nuclear medicine people have already taken dynamic, so will four D CT. So there is nothing four D. It is only dynamic event that anything that changes. It, you see in arterial phase, you see in venous phase. So in the between artery and vein, there is some time lapse. And you take two images and say, oh, this was 118. Now it has gone down to 112. So there is wash out. So you have to use the same in the adrenal, but you didn't get that set of uh, pictures here. So it's what I'm trying to show. People are medical science trying to some uh, coin some new words, buzz words, so which will be very catchy. That is the but conventionally the focused uh, ultrasound, MIB scan, and with the colon imaging adding to it. So we are now becoming more and more. We have that uh, 95 percent, but what about the 5 percent who failed? In, in 2001, Dr. Mamini told that every DM student must inform where is the parathyroid to go to the surgical OT and tell them because five cases consecutively were missed where there was it was identified. It was told to the endocrinologist, but somehow it was not communicated to the surgeon. So they did the exploration and they left out. And after that, Dr. Mamini made it as a must. All the endocrine residents should go to the surgery before the operation. Tell the surgeon that here it is left upper, right upper, or left lower, right lower, or in the thyrothymic ligament, or in the mediastinum, and that was on written communication to them. So this is the all evolved last three decades. This is the evolution of parathyroid imaging and parathyroid surgery over the time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chand. I think I have to thank all these people. Thank you very much. Because of that, we have a very good uh, team which does parathyroid surgery for now last 40 years. And we have been uh, operating in emergency such patients since 93. The first one I did was in 93. She was a girl who came from Jaipur, had a calcium of 16.5. We operated on a Sunday morning and we got the pathologist to come for frozen section. So that was unheard of and that was the kind of operation we have received. Thank you very much for being here.